Okay, so hi everyone and thank you for joining. I, uh, like I said, the meeting's being recorded so we can share this link with you uh, later and, and especially for the members who weren't able to join us during this time. Um, my name is Virginia Watson and I am the Atlanta Chapter Program Chair. So today's webinar is called Performance Improvement Beyond Instruction and it will present a model, methods, and so let me tell you a little bit about our speaker, which I, Guy W. Wallace does not need an introduction, but I'll tell you a little bit anyway. Um, Guy is a performance analyst and an instructional architect and has been designing and developing performance-based instruction, training, learning, and performance support content for the last 40 years. He's been consulting since 1982 with a specialized curriculum architecture design via a facilitated group process. Hopefully he'll tell us more about that. He served uh, more than 80 consulting clients, primarily in Fortune 500, and has won numerous awards for that work. In 2010, he received ISPI's highest award, which is Honorary Member for Life, for his contributions to both the technology of performance improvement and to the society. Guy has authored over 100 articles, 14 books, soon to be 15, and almost 4,000 blog posts. He's presented professionally over 115 times. He's very active on social media, including LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm going to post all his addresses in the chat feature in just a moment, and you can um, connect with him that way and see his website for lists of clients, descriptions of over 250 projects, publications, presentations, and over 400 free resources. Now, I'm going to turn this over to Guy because he's the one that we all want to hear from. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yes, uh, so I'm an old guy. I'm a gray beard, as you can tell by the video here. Let me see if I could bring up my uh, presentation. Performance improvement beyond instruction. I'm going to present a uh, talk around this model. That's uh, part of the first slide there, PB, PIBI. Um, this is all rooted in my lucky happenstance to have gotten a job back in August of 1979 with Wix Lumber up in uh, Saginaw, Michigan. It's no longer there. And I went to work for a small training department, 10 people. And in that department was the brother-in-law of Gary Rumler. Now, Gary Rumler is an ISPI luminary, past president, award winner, blah, blah, blah. He was my key mentor. And in that department, because his brother-in-law worked there, they had snagged two people from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Detroit, Michigan, who had worked with Gary's brother. And so I joined this training organization in a new subset of 10 person, and there was three of us, and we were going to be the program developers, developing instruction, job aids, and training. And these two people uh, indoctrinated me to a Rumler orientation to performance. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is based on what I learned uh, from Gary Rumler. I left Wix Lumber after 18 months and joined Motorola and I got to work with Gary Rumler for 18 months that I was there. He was my consultant which meant I carried his pencils around on my projects as he did his wizardry. And not wizardry, it was science. Um, but anyway, so this is what this is all about. So I've been in the business for a long time. I've been a Rumlerite or Rumler light for all of that time, heavily influenced by both uh, by Gary Rumler, uh, the late Gary Rumler, the late Tom Gilbert, who was Gary's partner at one time. We'll talk a little bit about that. The late Bob Mager, he just passed away a, a few months ago. Um, and later on, uh, another one of my mentors was Joe Harless, the late Joe Harless, who was from the Atlanta area, the south, the uh, west suburbs. Um, I think it's important for those who are in an instructional systems design role, instructional design role, learning experience developer role, training and development, learning and development. We got lots of names for these kinds of things. But this was important to me. Most of my consulting work since 1982 has been in the ISD realm. And, but one of the goals that I always had was that if I could uncover when training or instruction wasn't going to solve my client's problem, that we should avoid that and that I should help them see that so that I wouldn't create stuff that didn't have any value because that would reflect poorly on me. So whether or not you get a chance to work 
outside of the knowledge and skill issues in instruction, learning, whatever you want to call it, um, I think this is important to help you uh, help your client see what's at the root cause. Now, one of my favorite sayings is that a training request for new hires should be expected, but a training request to problem solve should be suspected. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but let me move on. So you can see, you already saw I'm a gray beard, but central to my whole approach to instructional systems design and performance improvement is the notion that performance competence, I'm gonna read this slide here, sorry, is the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs, what Gilbert called worthy outputs, to stakeholder requirements. It's not just the downstream customer, it might be the regulators, it might be management, it might be your peers that, you're, that are working with the performer, maybe suppliers, a lot of different kinds of stakeholders and they have requirements, but they have requirements possibly for the outputs and for the tasks or for both. So it's important to really keep our eye on the prize, which is performance competence. And also included with that is that, you know, this, this definition for performance competence, I believe works at four levels. It works at the individual level or the worker or people level. It works at the work level or the process level or what might nowadays be called the workflow. It works at the workplace organizational enterprise level because organizations, enterprises, companies, firms, government agencies, they have outputs that they produce for downstream use for their customers or their customer's customer. And so this is how to, I go about framing all of this as I learn from the, the mentors I've already mentioned. And then if we were to listen to Roger Kaufman, another ISPI, NSPI luminary, um, he has a term for the world or society doing societal goods, social responsibility, and that's mega. So there's micro, macro, and mega, and that's the, the ultimate, I guess. But anyway, so this definition, by my uh, desire, it was my intent that this definition should work at all of these levels. Now, warning, adopt what you can and adapt the rest. I use old school language because continuity is a double-edged sword. So I've been writing about this kind of stuff and presenting about this kind of stuff going back into the early 80s. And one of the things that I wanted to do over the years was keep a consistent set of language, my own, and kind of stick to that as best as I could. So uh, you need to probably adopt uh, little and adapt most of what I'm going to share with you today. And you don't uh, adapt it into your own learning and development or learning experience design language. You need to adapt it to the language of your clients, your enterprise, whoever you work for or are working with and uh, not make it a mystery for them to try to demystify. Okay. So one of the important things I learned a long time ago was to think of outputs as inputs, their inputs downstream. So in my little graphic here, the left to right kind of a thing, process Y way over there on the left, that their outputs could go in three different directions or more or one, but it was an output that was an input to the next process step, process X in this graphic. So it's important to always think of what Gilbert called the worthy outputs that are produced by behaviors, human behaviors, and the environmental resources that they had to work with, that that's really what it's all about, producing worthy outputs. And the worth of an output or the lack of worth of an output is judged by the various stakeholders, including the downstream um, customers. So this is an important model. I saw a version of this back in 1979 this happens to be a version that uh, uh, both Gary Rumler and Dale Brethauer uh, created as part of an article they did for one of my uh, company quarterly newsletters back in the uh, 90s. Um, and, but this model goes back to the 1960s at the University of Michigan where the two of them met. And this is the general systems model as Gary called it. Uh, Dale Brethauer had a different name for it, but this is the name that they put in uh, for this. And so there's five components to a process, if you will, at looking at it as a system. And there's the receiving system, the customers. There's the output, which is an input. 
the processing system, which are the series of tasks or steps or whatever language you have for all of that, whether it's automated or manual, or it's you know all human, or it's all uh, artificial intelligence or whatever it is, or a combination. And then there's the inputs to that. And then there's these feedback loops. In other versions of this kind of a diagram, Rumler broke out a special kind of feedback that he called consequences. Um, so there's variations on this model if you see some of the work that they did, but um, this is kind of central to my process orientation. And I've been process oriented since I came into the business here. And uh, of course, your approach may vary. And so you can adapt this to work with uh, your view of how the world works. All right, so Tom Gilbert, Gary Rumler's partner for a few years at a company called Praxis, published a book in 1978, and I was given this book on day one out of college in my training and development uh, organization. And this is a famous behavior engineering model, the BEM. This breaks things down into what's the environmental have to have, what's the person got to have, knowledge, capacity, motives. And the language is rather clunky, and so somewhat, this has been modified and adapted by many other people. Uh, Donald Bullock back in the uh, 80s was doing this. Uh, late Roger Chevalier uh, also adopted this and the very much alive Carl Binder has his own version of this that he calls the six boxes model and where he's simplified in the language and made it less complex. So this is, I think, key to looking at, you know, what, when you look at a process, you know, how can you decompose it, analyze it, deconstruct it? You know, what should you be looking for? This provides a framework for that. Now note, this is on page 88 of the book. On the prior page is my favorite graphic of the entire book. This is the behavior model for creating incompetence. Now, I've been showing this, these two charts to my clients since 1982, and I always showed them this one first. And they would get a good laugh about that because they laugh about, oh, don't tell, let people know how well they are performing. <laughs> Yeah, we do that all the time, guy. And so they could get a good laugh about this. And this is kind of a way to back into this more humorously. And the language here on this graphic is simpler than the uh, prior graphic, which is actually on the next page in the book. But uh, so again, this is a framework. And so this was very influential to me. And I hope that this or the newer versions of this can be influential to you as you look at performance beyond instruction, performance improvement beyond instruction. So after my 18 months at Wix Lumber working with all these Rumler people, um, I went to Motorola and they were big into quality, eventually uh, created Six Sigma, which to do that, they licensed the intellectual property of Gary Rumler when they created Six Sigma. And if you looked at the work that Gary Rumler was doing and that part of his life, he was doing what now is called lean. He had left instructional design pretty much and was looking at all the other ways to look at and improve performance. But I came across this diagram, the Ishikawa diagram, also known as the cause and effect diagram, the fishbone diagram. This comes out of the 1950s Japan and the quality movement after World War II. And this kind of gave me a perspective, it was wrong, but it gave me a perspective about, oh, human performance technology, that stuff that ISPI, NSPI always talked about back then in the 1980s. So any process it can be decomposed and analyzed in terms of the non-politically correct men, materials, methods, and machines. And so this is the 1980 version of that. Um, and so this helped me think about, oh, there's, yeah, more to performance of a process than just the human factor, the human variable. And so I, this was really important to me and insightful to me and it helped me a lot. So now we're going to get into kind of my model set, you know, adaptations of things that I have stolen, I mean, borrowed from others. And uh, I've changed the uh, orientation from left to right to upstream to downstream in this graphic, if you will. So there's a bunch of processes there in the graphic and there's all these various enablers. When I first created this model, uh, Darlene Van Team, maybe some of you know her, she's past president of ISPI, blah, blah, blah. And she said, oh, this model, this is very interesting take on Gilbert's behavior engineering model. And I said, 
no, this is the Ishikawa diagram that I have adapted. And she said, oh, interesting. Well, that caused me to think about how little I am cognizant of who influenced me and where did I get some of the ideas and concepts that I have. And it's come from many, many, many different places. And I'm not a trained academic, academic in this world, so I don't cite the research and references that I have. And I, I, I don't do that, it's bad on me. But this has come from a lot of different places, but this is my adaptation of that. Um, so again, in the mid 90s, I kind of put this all together and I really claim it's really the Ishikawa diagram because it's got more than the men uh, methods and materials machines, but that's where the spine, the fishbone nature of this comes from. But a lot of this is obviously influenced by uh, Gilbert and, and many, many, many others. So. I can't uh, credit them all on this slide. Uh, you wouldn't see the graphic. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's the intent of this. So one of the things that Gary Rummler taught me was, uh, and he's out, got a video at my first day at Motorola, one week before my official start date, I came into Motorola to attend a one day workshop put on by this guy named Gary Rummler, who I'd already been following and knew a lot about. And that video, a 46 minute video of that is on the online, on the web, on YouTube, I posted it. He gave me permission to do so. And in that he talks about this, but basically what I learned is that the first thing to do when you've got a performance problem is not look at the human being and indict them and go try to figure out how to fix them. No, the first thing is to look at the process itself that the people are in. If there's a problem and we blame and management's blaming the individuals, the team, the, you know, the people in the organization, step back and look at the process. And he would say, is there one? Is it being adhered to if there is one? And then if there is one that's being adhered to, is it been designed to actually meet the requirements or do we have a process? Everybody's doing it, but it's still not working very well. So the first focus is on the process itself. <clears throat> Most processes are informal. Most processes are unnamed. Uh, people doing them may have given it a name, but it's not universally understood or known within the enterprise or the department that that's what we call this thing, especially if the workforce is distributed and they're not all in the same location working and talking with each other all the time and they've uh, come to some sort of consensus on what do we call this process? So where one process begins and ends may be different than another person's view of, well, that's really three processes, guy. That's not just one. So processes are a mess. But that's one of the first things to look at is to get a handle on it. And that model that I showed you, the general systems model, how to look at a process is the starting point. That's the not quite the most granular level that you can look at, but that's where you start when you're thinking about processes. And so I would have put in this orange box that general systems model and then said, oh, here's all the enablers, as I call them, human asset enablers, the environmental asset enablers. Enablers. A lot of people don't like the phrase human assets as if that's not you know, quite I don't know, politically correct. So you can change that to whatever you think you need to, to be something that resonates within your uh, uh, performance context. But this is how I begin to look at all of that. So, if it's not the process or their process could be part of the problem, but let's not just jump on that because we've seen a symptom, you know, what are the root causes of the process not being quite correct? And so the second thing that Rumler taught me to look at are the environmental enablers. And this is my model for that. It's not going to reflect exactly his, but there's data and information, materials and supplies, tools and equipment, facilities and grounds, budget and headcount and culture and consequences. And up, you know, if you think back to the Ishikawa diagram and the four Ms, the men, materials, methods, and machines, well, that, that, those four Ms didn't cover all the things here, especially in the environmental side. So the, one of the things that I learned from Gary Rumler is that if it's not the process or it's the process, now let's look at the consequence system, which is part of the culture, I think. Everybody's got a different view of how this all looks and fits together and all that stuff. And so this is just mine. So I wanna look at the culture and the consequences. So what is what are the expectations? What are the rewards that reinforce certain behaviors? What are the punishments that extinguish behaviors that are non-desirable? Do we actually have a situation where we're rewarding the wrong performance, the undesirable performance, and we're um, punishing 
the performance that we want? I mean, do we give good workers more work to do than anybody else? Because they, after all, hey, they're good at it and they can get it done quickly. So we overload them. So that's just one simple example. But so that's what I learned from Rumler was to really look next at the environment and some of the simple things, but basically in the video that if you would go look at it, he'll talk about the consequence system. And he's got a funny story about the people at an airport at the uh, ticket gate and the kinds of uh, consequence system that drove the wrong kinds of behaviors there. Um, but anyway, so that's important. So then of course we do need, so are there the environmental enablers adequate to the needs of the process? They don't have to be perfect, they just need to be adequate to the process to keep the process running and humming along smoothly, uh, meeting all the requirements. So the third thing that we to look at is, you know, about the humans in place and do they have the awareness, knowledge and skills? Did we train them or are we expect them to just pick that up on their own? Maybe they're doing informal learning and it's not working quick enough or well enough or they're, they're adapting myths to their practice and that's a problem. Did we hire as our selection system looking for the physical attributes, the psychological attributes, the intellectual attributes and the personal values that are necessary to perform in the process? So we can look at all of those kinds of things and you know, we can accommodate certain kinds of physical uh, issues here uh, and that's getting easier and easier as the decades roll on. But uh, so if there are gaps in what the humans bring to the performance process party, should T and D training and development, learning and development, learning ex experience design kinds of folks be addressing those gaps? Or is this really something that we should have done better with recruiting and selection? Are we trying to pound square pegs into the round holes or vice versa? is uh, one of the old school sayings that uh, you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so this is a, a favorite quote. There's many versions of this from, this is from 1983 in Training Magazine, but if you put a book, good performer in or against the bad system, the system wins every time. And again, there's versions of this. I heard him talk about this and use this phrase back in 1981 when I got a chance to work with him. Um, but Rumler would claim that is between 80 and 90 percent of all performance problems are tied to the environment and not to the performer. And by environment, he also meant the process. Um, I just extracted that for my own visual uh, nature because I wanted to also reflect the Ishikawa diagram. So uh, this is this is really critical. And there are other people who also talk about this. Dead center here, Deming. Talked about 94% of the problems or possibilities for improvement lie within the system. Uh, not that he was saying that the other 6% are because of people and non-training fa factors, no. But, but Deming held management responsible for the system, which means how the process worked, all the environmental enablers, did you hire the right people, did you train them appropriately? And then if things are not going quite well, that's management's fault, not the people. So he also uh, would shift the blame from people, individuals, to the system, to which management has control of. Uh, Rod, uh, Robert Nager, Bob Nager talked about this. Harold Stolovich talked about this. Harold Stolovich just turned 80 years old just a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, um, the late Roger Chevalier, who I mentioned a little bit earlier, talked about this as well. So everybody's kind of talking about it. it's the 80%-ish uh, kind of a thing here that's got nothing to do with people's knowledge and skills. And I bring this up, as I said earlier, even if you're just working in the instructional design, instructional systems design end of things, you want to help, you, you want to avoid building training, instructional content, learning content when it's not going to do anything but spend money and waste shareholder equity. And that's a sin of our profession and it's just way too prevalent. And so you need some way when you're doing whatever type of analysis you're doing to figure out if the root problem is knowledge and skills and or these other variables. So I'm going to turn it back to Virginia to see if there's any questions that's been shared on the, uh, in the chat area. No questions yet, Guy. I'll be on the lookout for them, though. Okay. So that's your cue, everyone. If you have questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat area. I'm not looking at that, so I can't see that. But uh, 
anyway, so so that's kind of the background of you know how I was influenced and how I think about all this stuff. So now how do you now to get down to brass tacks? How do you go about looking at all this stuff? So this is an example. This is adapted from work that I did in the 1980s for a, an account representative, a, a salesperson. Um, and you know, so the, one of the first things I do is I organize my view of performance into what I call areas of performance. These have also been known as accomplishments. That's what Gilbert would have called them. They're also called major duties. They're also called key results areas. There's a lot of language for this. In an engineering sense, it's a work breakdown structure. So if you take the performance and you break it down into parts so that we can look at it further and analyze it, and yes, they all interact. But so what is the job? Well, for the account representative, it was they do territory planning. They do account planning within the territories. They do customer call planning and preparation. They actually conduct a call. They do follow up and hopefully uh, make a sale. They do all sorts of reports and administration kind of junk, their least favorite stuff. And they all do personal development because as they told me back then, our company doesn't tell us about the competition. I got to go figure that out for myself. So yeah, I attend company training events and things like that, but there's a lot of this stuff I've got to do myself. And so we gave it the name personal development and you either get help with it by the company or you're completely on your own. And that was part of the job as they saw it. Anyway, so that's a kind of a work breakdown structure of this sales account representatives. And then this is an example of me then detailing out for every one of those seven chunks, territory planning, what's the output? How do you measure one? We capture that. Now there's different ways to go about gathering this data. And it's really less about the methods of how you gather the data than the data integrity, how accurate, complete, and appropriate is the data that you've captured. So I'm an output kind of guy, we're the output. So when you're doing this territory planning thing, guy would ask, what do you produce when you're done? When the dust settles and you're done with that, how do you know you're done? What have you got? And it's a territory plan and it includes all this kind of stuff in there. And then my next set of questions is usually, so what are the key tasks or the detailed tasks or the micro tasks? This is a kind of high level here in this example. What are the key tasks that one performs to produce that output called the territory plan? And so I gathered that data and we took a look at that and that kind of is ideal performance. Now I facilitate groups of master performers who come to consensus on that's the output, those are the measures, these are the key tasks, that's the correct wording. I don't hate it guy, I don't really love it, but I don't hate it so it's okay. You know, when you're working with a team of people, you gotta come to consensus on things. So we're trying to get a picture of, so what would we train people to do? Well, we train them to perform these tasks, to reduce those outputs and meet those measures. That's kind of the goal. So I would also ask these master performers that I would have facilitated or met with one-on-one. -on -one. So tell me about the non-master performers, the people that are struggling. What are their typical performance gaps? And that's over on the right side. And what are the probable gap causes? So if they've got this gap, why? And is that then a deficiency of, of what type? So let's slide in here to look at this a little bit bigger. So there's the output territory plan. There's the key tasks. The details are not important here. What is important is that on the left side of this chart is what I would call ideal performance. Now people might say, guy, that's not really ideal. So then again, adapt my language to something that works within your organization. <coughs> Excuse me. So I try to capture, that's the ideal. That's what we would train people to do. That's what the master performers are doing. At least that's what they say they're doing. Now, just because people say that that's what they're doing and you get eight to 12 master performers in a room and they all agree on that, doesn't mean that that's actually right, but it's a good start. But you gotta, you gotta be wary about that. You gotta be uh, uh, open to the fact that, you know, it may be somewhat accurate, but maybe incomplete. Maybe they're missing a couple of key tasks in there, the micro level tasks and such. Uh, and uh, hopefully it's appropriate. So accuracy, completeness, and appropriateness. But so the next part is to then figure out, okay, so what's the performance gaps? So when I look at what are the performance gaps, I wanna know what measures of the outputs are the non-master performers typically struggling with? And they might tell me, well, the plan is incomplete or no plan is developed at all. 
And then we want to know, well, why is that? Well, they don't know how, they don't take the time, it's not demanded by management. So the first one, not know how, that's a deficiency of their knowledge and skills. Maybe the whole system here doesn't train them in how to do that, and that's why. And some people have figured it out, master performers have figured it out, but others haven't. Or they just don't take the time because they're so busy with other things. Task interference is the typical name that's given to that. Or it's not demanded by management in the first place, so nobody does it unless you uh, master performers say, hey, this is the smart thing to do. I'm going to go ahead and do this. I don't care about everybody else. I'm going to make my sales numbers. But that's a deficiency of the environment. Now, maybe managers need to be trained, and it's a deficiency of knowledge of management, but it's right now from this perspective of this performer, the sales account representative, it's not due to their some of it's not due to their knowledge and skills. But anyway, so that's how I go about doing it. We break the work down or we look at one thing, maybe the whole thing was just look at territory planning in the first place and we weren't looking at the whole job. But if I needed to look at the whole job, I have a way to do that. So that helps me understand, you know, what are the stakeholder requirements for tasks and outputs? And stakeholders are a tricky bean, and I kind of alluded to this before. There's different views of this. You could say, well, the owners are the ultimate stakeholder, shareholders, the people that own all the shares of the company. And then there's a hierarchy here. So when push comes to shove and stakeholders don't agree on what the requirements are, this is who wins, the people at the top. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. Customers may lead with what the requirements are, but if the owners say, hey, we'll go broke meeting the customer's requirements, so you know what? We're not going to do that. They win. So who sets the requirements? It's the stakeholders. And you got to figure out in your environment, who is it? Well, if you live in a, gov in a land, in a country where there's government laws, regulations, and codes, it doesn't matter what the owners and shareholders want ultimately. It's the government because they'll throw you and throw the owners and shareholders in jail and fine them or whatever, and that hurts the shareholders. But so the government could be the ultimate in this. Now, if your company is all about social responsibility, they might have this kind of a view in it uh, that says, you know, society, the greater good, blah, 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 is what should govern things. And in fact, governments work for their uh, governed, uh, theoretically, and so society should have an impact uh, and it should be reflected in the government laws, regulations, and codes, and shareholders and owners and enterprise needs to exist within all of that stuff. So stakeholders, um, also have stakeholders. So figuring out what are the tasks and outputs to be produced, and it's more than just understanding the customer or the customer's customer, because the customer's customer could have different government regulations that they need to adhere to, and they live in a different country with a different set of laws, regulations, and codes, and you've be, gotta be cognizant of that if you wanna produce worthy outputs. And if you're selling your worthy outputs to more than one country and their laws, regulations, and codes vary, it gets a little bit trickier. Anyway, not to belabor all of that. So this is the key model. It's all about performance or performance competence, which is you know, all about tasks and outputs and meeting the stakeholder requirements. And when I work with master performers, they are generally able to tell me what those things are. And there could be the company published policies and procedures that you've got to adhere to. And the master performers might tell me, actually, no, those aren't true because we break those all the time and no one cares because we make our sales numbers. Oh, so there's stated requirements, but they're not the real ones. Nope, guy, that's not how the real world works. Okay, so I've learned a lot doing that. So I can replace that performance competence graphic with this, the performance model. And so how, what, what are the enablers, human-wise and environmental-wise, that would allow people to produce outputs by performing those tasks? So that's key and critical. Now, I have a way of capturing these enablers that I've now circled in red. And that is by using what I call the uh, enabler matrices. And this first one is the knowledge and skill matrices. And I'll show you in a minute how this all works, but I can have matrices on the attributes and values. So the physical, psychological, intellectual attributes and the personal values. I can have something on the data and information. I can have something on the materials and supplies that are necessary for performance. 
the tools and equipment, the facilities and grounds, the culture and consequences, the budget and headcount requirements. So there's a way to break all this down and organize it all together. Sorry if this makes you all crazy. Um, so the next thing here is I'm using my own version of Addy over here on the left in the blue boxes, and I'm going to show you how I might systematically derive the enablers. The first box is project planning and kickoff, and our category is tools and equipment. So when we're doing project planning and kickoff, um, what do we need? Well, we might need, and I'm, I didn't use real words here to hang us all up here, but I would say, oh, I need this one particular tool and equipment or machinery when I'm doing my project planning and kickoff. And you might, you know, that could have been an Excel spreadsheet or, uh, or a computer, laptop. Um, and I need that when I'm doing uh, part A of the job, which, you know, was territory planning in the other example, but is project planning and kickoff in this one. Um, if I shift gears and say, okay, that's all you needed. This is a simple example. So it's got its shortcomings. But when I'm doing analysis, what do I need? Well, I need the old DEFGHI thing when I'm doing B or two, phase two. Or when I'm just shift gears and doing design, then I'm gonna need something else. And when I'm doing, oh, I need a second thing when I'm doing design, a second tool, equipment, or machine. And then when I'm doing development, and then when I'm doing my pilot testing after development, and then post pilot testing, I'm doing revision and release. And again, this is my uh, adaptation of the ANTI model. And so I can basically describe all the things, all the tools and equipment, and I can do the same drill for figuring out, well, what are the culture and consequences that are needed? What are the data and information? What are the materials and supplies? What are the physical attributes that are required? I can list those. And again, it's all about data integrity. And so how you go about getting the data to fill in the stuff in the red depends on you know, what methods are available to you. I, again, like to assemble a team of master performers and other subject matter experts and systematically process them through creating the performance model and these enabler matrices. Um, so here we are again, any questions? Yes, Guy, we actually have some questions and they are, um, they are very similar in category. So um, I'll, I'd like to read you all of them, um, or at least a summary of them, so you could, because your answer could combine them. Uh, Cassandra and Glenn both expressed that they, in their experience, um, even when they, say, when they explain to management that um, training might not be the answer, that they that management doesn't always agree. Um, and so we're wondering, you know, what tactics you've used to show leaders that the solution isn't a good use of resources and money. So that's one. And then Denise said, it seems like this process will very quickly surface an organization's HR policies that could inhibit performance, for example, hiring, compensation, or awards. And do you engage HR staff in the analysis process? And if so, at what point? And I think another question came in, but I'll, I'll let you handle these two and, um, and I'll bring the other one up when you're done. Sure. So yeah, training isn't the answer. Sometimes it's a check the box kind of a thing and your client um, simply wants to be done with it and say that they addressed it. And they don't have the time or patience or inclination or knowledge to think about this any deeper than that. So that forces us into being uh, what's often called an order taker and just responding to the client request and not being able to challenge them. So um, how do I, sh there's several ways that I use to show them that's the answer. So um, depending on whether or not your organization has an intake process where you take a request and, and kind of scrub it and take a look at it in a deeper level to figure out, you know, is this a worthy thing for us to tackle? That's a policy decision of your organization. Um, the best way, uh, one of the ways to do this is to basically assemble the client and a group of stakeholders. So, so you have a requester um, and then you have others that, that come in and um, uh, stakeholders, for example, if somebody comes to you and says they need something for sales, well, I'd want to get all the sales regional vice presidents engaged in this project so they can put their eye to it and decide that this is a waste of time. We don't need that. 
and that shuts it down when it's not, unless it's got some promise and they think there's something to it. So, but if training isn't the answer, when I ask my, I assemble the project steering team, the requester, the client, and the key stakeholders so that they can lend and do business decisions within an instructional design project. Um, that helps so that one person can't, you know, take us in the wrong direction because there's a, there's a team there of stakeholders who might say, well, wait a minute, guy, that's, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Maybe we don't need training. Maybe we need to do something else. Um, so that's, that's one way is assembling a, a more than one client, more than one requester. Now that's difficult to do. And sometimes you just don't want to die on that particular hill and you just salute and go do the project. And I would tell a client, you know, I don't think that's the answer. I'm an outside consultant. So I come in, they, they bring me in. I say, I'll do it for you. I don't think it's worth it. And I don't think it's worthy of it. And I don't think that's really going to solve anything. But if you really want me to do it, I'll do it for you. And I'll send you the invoices at the end of the month. And that might cause them to go, whoa, wait a minute, guy, what do you mean? And that gives me a chance to talk to them. Now, one of the things I learned from the, Lord, uh, the late Joe Harless was to never say no. And he said this in a conference back in 85. And he said, he said, never respond to a client request with, in your whiniest voice, are you sure it's a training problem? <laughs> because he hated that because he, that's what people were going around the conferences saying, don't be an order taker, push back. Joe would always say, yes, I can help you. And if you let me do a little front end analysis, I can help you even more. And then he would take the climb along on the journey, much like I would try to do using my project steering team and go do the analysis and let the data chips fall where they may. Because if you look, think about my performance model that I showed you, it might've said that everything was a DE, a deficiency in the environment. It had nothing to do with the human the humans in the process and their knowledge and skills. Who says so? All the master performers. Who picked those master performers so that we would hear their voice? I always ask the project steering team to handpick people they trust because I warn them that you might not like the data that comes back and I, you'll kill me, the messenger, and I got nothing to do with it other than going and collecting the information. So if your hand master, handpicked master performers tell you it ain't a training problem, it probably isn't. But now, if it's for to solve a problem, maybe training is needed for the new hires that are coming in, and we need the training for them, and the problem will always exist. But one of the things that we've done is we've captured both the ideal performance and we've captured the gaps. And one of the things I talk about when I capture the gap information is that even if my client can't go fix the problems that aren't due to the performer's knowledge and skills, we can give a heads up to the new people, to everybody else about what the problems are, what the root cause is, and we can then use the mass performers and get their strategies and tactics on how they avoid the barriers to performance in the first place and what they do if they were unavoidable in the second place. So there is worth in going in, at least conducting the analysis and then letting the client make the decision. Now, if they are going to force you to spend money and time and effort on some nonsense that isn't really needed, you've got to decide, you know, do I die on that hill um, or and push back or do I just go along and try to build trust and relationships so maybe next time they trust me. Well, if you're internal, that can work. If you're external, you could push back, but if you don't have a trusted relationship, they'll just go for the next consultant group, the next contractor, and get them to do the work. So it's a it's not an easy answer, but the best approach is to take the client on the journey and have them do the discovery via analysis with you so that they might say at some point, oh, this doesn't look like a training is going to solve this guy. Uh, I, need to, I need to cancel your contract, I think. And I would say, looks that way to me. It's happened numerous times. Um, HR, yeah, we could run into HR policies and all that stuff. I would never engage HR if I've assembled a project steering team of the key stakeholders, like those regional vice presidents of sales. I'll let them go beat on HR to change those darn policies and procedures and practices that are getting in the way. Um, uh, now, once they're, once HR gets wind of this is how we're doing this, they may want to get involved in the projects and all of that. But you know, it is what it is. If their HR policies are inhibiting performance, there might be a 
darn good reason for that. Like this keeps us from breaking the law and getting sued and, and having the company name changed to whoever wins in court. So, you know, just because HR policies seem to get in the way doesn't mean that they are wrong in the big picture. They may be inhibitors. They may force us to do our performance, our processes a little bit different, a little bit awkward, a little bit longer, a little bit more cautiously. And there may be darn good reason for that. So you got to be open to all of that. So what was the next question? Well, actually, they weren't questions. There were a lot of people chiming in to um, respond about how they've done it, which seemed aligned with your response, which I thought was great. And Denise added just now that she's also been able to include in her in the training that she develops a lesson on process analysis so that everyone can look at their own processes, you know. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, so instead of creating dependencies of our clients and the, the learners, if we were to create independent people who can figure this out for themselves, we might get targeted at uh, high stakes performance where the risks and rewards are high versus the low hanging fruit kind of stuff where the risks and rewards are kind of low, but it's got mass appeal. It's not going to cost all that much. So, you know, we, we get used in all sorts of variety of ways. We get used to create training programs when an email or some com communications, a video might have been sufficient. So we get used to address awareness issues and knowledge issues and skill issues and sometimes performance competence issues. So we, we exist in this space here where we're a service unit uh, supporting uh, our clients and stakeholders and we just need to have quick ways to do communications that aren't so arduous. But if it's high stakes performance, nuclear engineer operators, um, and they need performance competence, you betcha. We have to have a rigorous process that's still quick, but really gets to the root of everything and really does a good job of training folks. Anyway, so thank you. And uh, yeah, you have you guys have stolen a lot of the good ideas that I've stolen, or excuse me, borrowed from many others in the past. So the next slide is the enablers. Um, again, this is just my view of that, the humans, and everything that's non-human, what are they? And so that's my classification scheme. Change it if you want. Your organization may have something in their ERP system, uh, Enterprise Requirements Planning uh, System, which is uh, came from Material Requirements Planning and then went to Manufacturing Requirements Planning, MRP2, and that became Enterprise Requirements Planning. So there may be systems in place here that you would need to conform with, reflect in your teasing out all these variables. This is just mine. And I've had clients tell me, oh, we need to change this one to something else and use different language. That's fine. I have to have some place to start. Over on the right, a whole bunch of different kinds of improvement interventions, if you will, concepts, models, methods, tools, and techniques. There's a whole world of them. This is just a subset of all that stuff. There's things at the worker level, which has some overlap with at the work workflow level, at the workplace level, at the world level. Um, and so the more cognizant you are of all of these other types of improvement interventions, the better you will be at your intervention. Because if you know about these interventions and what they do, that might give you some insight to uncover some of the variables and what might the solution set be. Um, so I, I'm going to shift here. This so. Uh, this is my uh, my performance improvement methodology branded blah blah blah. That's not important. You may have to change this too. And I've got two stages of this. The first stage is to, to uncover what the heck is wrong and what are we going to do about it. So that's project planning and kickoff, analysis of the current state, designing the future state where we say, oh, you know, there's going to we're going to need to do this, that, and this other thing to fix the current state. And so now we can do some implementation planning and then we can figure out what's the return on that investment or net assets or return on equity or whatever the business metrics are when you make significant investments. Uh, just because it's training or instruction aimed at people doesn't mean it's a good thing all the time. Maybe it's not worth doing. So there's the second stage, once we figure out what it is, we can do more detailed project planning and do analysis, design, development, pilot test, and revision and release. And this is basically how I approach instruction at two different levels. Um, but so my example, so here it is, you know, one epi stage one effort could lead to a whole bunch of different interventions, uh, all done all at once or staggered. We got to do this and this first. 
And then when those things are done, we can do these other things. And that's how we're going to have to tackle some messy, sticky, wicked problem that we might have uncovered and found out what the solutions are to that. Um, another way to look at stage two here is if you look over there on the right, it says there's three work streams. One is process redesign. Then we have to update our standard operating procedures because we've updated the process, redone it. And now we're gonna have to train people on that. We're gonna have to give information to the incumbents. This is what we've changed. This is how you have to do things differently. And for all the new people coming in, they gotta be trained on the new process because they know not the new process or the old process. They just need to learn how to do the job. So that's the green C work stream at the bottom there. So we can start off by doing some kind of uh, macro planning and that, and that leads us to analysis. But if we're smart, we're gonna combine the analysis to look at the, what are the process, SOP and training implications of the new process. So A takes the lead, B and C follow. Um, and depending on you know, what the prior knowledge is of the performers and all that stuff, we might not have to train them on everything unless they're new people coming in and they don't know anything and therefore we've got to start at ground zero with them. So we may have two sets of training eventually uh, because some people know the old process, maybe not every last thing changed, et cetera. And then we can do design of our process, new design of the SOPs, new design of the training, and then we can take a look before we start actually developing anything, compare all three designs together to see are they compatible or, or are they kind of off kilter in some places and fix that and update the design before we actually go and do the development of the new process, the new SOPs, the new training, and then we can take, excuse me, uh, we can take a look at the uh, development, uh, look at the develop, what we've developed and say, does this seem to really work and fix anything with that before we actually put it into a pilot test, what I like to call a full destructive test where I try to break everything that I'm testing and put it through the rigorous so because we want to actually find those problems and fix them before we release it if we're dealing with high stakes performance, high risk, high reward. If we're dealing with things where we can do, you know, a beta version of everything and release it and find out what's wrong and then fix it, then you do it a little bit differently. Um, so I'm usually brought in to handle things that are of some significance and uh, within some of those things that have a lot of significance, high risk, high reward, there's always stuff that has less risk and less reward. So I've been there and done that too. So then we can you know, do the pilot test and figure out if everything works sufficiently or we've uncovered some issues that need to be fixed and then we can do a revision and then release it and have it go into ongoing use. And we can do continuous improvement there and we can do evaluation of it as it's operating in the real world and debug it over time or maybe government regulations change and we need to tweak our process again and update the SOPs and reflect all of that in the training as well. So many ways to get into all of that. Any more questions or comments or concerns? I haven't seen any more uh, questions, Guy, but we are coming close to the one o'clock um, yep. time frame. I know that anyone who would be willing to stick around for another 30 minutes would benefit greatly, but for those who have to leave, by all means, um, we will be posting the recording on the chapter website and the slide, these slides are, could be downloaded from the top of the chat box. Okay. Um, so again, uh, whether this is just mine, so of course you got to use your instructional system design stuff. Mine is called PAC. My performance improvement is called METHI. The important thing here is that my instructional design methodologies are a subset of my performance improvement methodologies by design. When I started formulating all this stuff back in the 80s as a consultant with a team, and I had to train everybody to use some sort of a standard approach like engineers might rather than an artist colony. Um, I needed everybody to be working together and so that a project you do uh, last year that I do next year is all going to be compatible. So I can't have everybody just doing it any old way that they wanted to. But the real intersection of the Venn diagram between a performance improvement methodology and an instructional system design methodology is in analysis. And that's really, we all need to be able to come together and work off the same kind of analysis. And if you're working with people from total quality management, some quality group of some sort, uh, some engineering group, they have their own methods, they have their own language, and you may need to adapt all of that to reflect them. 
because they may be the bigger fish in the sea. I've got a, a chapter from the 2006 Handbook of Human Performance Technology, chapter level 11 on modeling master performance, mastery performance and systematically der deriving the enablers for performance improvement. The title itself added at least uh, 14 ounces to the, to the weight of the book. Um, it's available as a free 25 page PDF. That's the, you can get it off my website there. Well, you can look at that uh, to your heart's content. And uh, this is all about improving performance together. Um, you working in partnership with your client, the stakeholders, master performers, other subject matter experts. Um, and it's all about performance competence or whatever you adapt that language to. So thank you for your time today. Feel free to connect with me with any questions, comments, or concerns, and I'll be hanging around for another up to a half hour or so, uh, and we can uh, talk uh, about this further. But thank you very much. Okay, we still have quite a few people um, hanging around. So gluttons uh, for punishment. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we could try an experiment where people unmute themselves if they would like to say something or ask you a question. Uh, if it gets a little overwhelming, then maybe we would go back to the um, to typing the questions in the chat box. But if you'd well, like they to, can, yep. why don't you have them raise their hand and then you can call on them one by one and we'll try to get to everybody. Yeah, I, I think I can pull my screen open enough where I can see everyone's um, feed here. So if you'd like to try to use the raised hand feature, I'll be looking. Everybody's off multitasking. Well, I will say that uh, someone before they dropped off, I, uh, I think it was Beth Ann, she was saying that she would love uh, a case study on this, but I, and I told her to go and look on your website. I imagine she would find a lot there, but do you want to there talk about some ex experiences you've had? Yeah, so I've, I've done this uh, numerous times actually, because I've, um, but most of mine is when I do the performance modeling, I've been doing that since basically 1979, different versions of it. We call it a performance table, then we call it a performance model. Some people call that thing a job model, but I'm often looking at uh, more than one job. So calling it a job model when it was multiple jobs didn't make sense. So shifted the language on that. But uh, since my work is mostly ISD, I would do the knowledge and skill matrices and tease out systematically all of the knowledge and skills that are required to support performance. Um, and when, but in the performance analysis, before we got to the knowledge and skills, when we discovered here's the ideal performance, here's the gaps, here's the probable causes, here's how we would categorize those probable causes as deficiency of the environment, deficiency of uh, individual attributes and values or deficiencies of knowledge and skill my clients sometimes were interested in those deficiencies of the environment. And so what are those more specifically? Well, my job was to do training things. So I'm going to train people on, on how to deal with performance barriers now that we've uncovered them. But I wasn't going to go into great detail about, you know, what those were and how to fix them. But I've been asked to, or I've been asked to work with, in the old days, they call them critical action teams. Um, that were assembled to go fix these problems that Guy and the master performers uncovered. You know, I'm just the facilitator. What do I know? They could have all lied to me, and I, that's what I wrote down. Um, at least that's what I tell my clients. Um, so that's why we need master performers here. And if that's what they say, that uh, allows points action teams, critical action teams, to go fix things based on these master performers. And, you know, sometimes the master performers. Uh, identify symptoms rather than the root cause. And so you just don't want to go tackle a symptom. You really got, need to get down to the root cause. So there's a bunch of people in the quality world and elsewhere that might have the knowledge and skills and experience to form a team to go after and solve some of these things. Um, but if, regarding case studies, I've got some examples of some of this, but it's mostly instructional design and doesn't go beyond that. And my clients have given me permission to publish some of that, but most of this stuff is proprietary. I'm dealing right. with large companies, so I can't really share 
all of that, but you can get a sense of it by looking at some of the things that I've got on my website that have the performance model for sales jobs, have all the knowledge and skill requirements captured. Um, and that's as close. Right. So as far as the, the master performers, are they always identified by the, um, the people who hire you or the stakeholders or management or something like that? And then what would be your next step be? Would you have a focus group with them? Yeah. So uh, back in 1981, I, uh, I, before I started doing it this particular way, I was work, an employee at Motorola and I was working with manufacturing materials and purchasing people and I had done a big analysis report and I walked into a room full of 30 manufacturing operations managers, moms, um, and they, the, the head guy took a look at my analysis report because I always put, you know, who are the contributors on the front cover? And he threw the three wing binder that was probably about an inch thick across the room. And he said, this is no good, this is garbage. He didn't like two of the names that were there. They were what I now call, and I've written about this in a couple of books. These are the friends of training who show up every time there was a need, they were happy to volunteer. And I guess it's because their organizations were happy to see them gone so that they would work with me and be my source. They were more than happy to do that, very cooperative, but they had absolutely zero credibility. They had negative credibility with my clients. Wow. And that guy threw the, so I said after that, so my recovery to that was that, well, I guess we're gonna have to do this over again. Why don't you tell me who I should be working, <laughs> which is what I asked for originally, but they never gave me the name. So this is the consequences of that. It's all my fault. So please give me the names of the people that you trust to work with that. And I wanna work with them in a group meeting. And so I wanna facilitate them. So I wanna get them all together rather than me going to one person, person A, they tell me one thing, person B tells me something a little bit different and actually contradicts the first person and the third person contradicts both of the two people. And then I gotta go round and round and round trying to clean that mess up. Why don't we get together in a room for three days and just battle it out and be done with it? rather than taking three months or three weeks or longer than three days. And so they agreed to do that. So then it became a, well, how do you choose a master performer? What Tom Gilbert called the exemplars. And this is tricky. And, you know, I would ask the client, you know, who's your best performers? Who's the absolute best? If you give me, if you don't want to give me a name because then they won't be working that day or for three days and that you don't really like that. That's probably the right person. So, who would you miss the most? Who's the best of the best? Not that they're perfect, because no one is, um, but who would be the best people? If we wanted to train people to emulate somebody, you know, I come from Chicago, so we would have said, you know, we, we train basketball players, we want them to be like Mike. And some of you don't know who that is, that's Michael Jordan. And so we want, you know, so he, if he's the ideal, the exemplar performer, we want to train everybody with all his ticks, tips and tricks and how to be like Mike. That's what we're trying to do here. And so the clients would go, mm, and they'd give me their best person. I said, you want, you want them involved anyway, right? Because you live with the consequences of whether this is gonna be any good or not. And if you give me middle of the road players, performers, I'm gonna give you a middle of the road pro product. Uh, if you give me the bottom of the barrel, well, I'm gonna produce a piece of garbage. And you know what? I won't know because I don't do the job for a living. So I'll be just listening to them and we'll reflect everything that they tell us. So if you really want the top, tier instruction for your people, job aids and training, then you're gonna to have to give me your top people. And I'm gonna put them in a room and they've got all big egos and they're gonna argue with each other and we're gonna have a lot of heated agreements where somebody says it's the, and the other person says it's the, and then it takes us a while to figure out that that's actually the same thing. And so we gotta go through all of that to get a consensus on what are the outputs, what are the measures, what are the tasks, where are the non-mass performers going wrong? What are the uh, really key enabling knowledge and skills that you got to have? And we go through that process and get that together. And then I've said to clients, and then I'd like to use those same people after we've generated the analysis, reviewed the analysis with you, the project steering team, we'd like to go and, and use those people on the design effort, a subset of them, not the whole analysis team, eight to 12 people, master performers, and I, but I've learned to say that after a while is that those master performers are going to demand that they be included in the design because they're not going to want to drop out of the project. And my clients would always laugh and the stakeholders would always laugh. Oh, God, no. They'll be so happy to be done with you and your process I can tell you already. And then they're, they're, you know, I would tell them, I borrowed it from Saturday Night Live, 
hear me now, believe me later, because master performers who finally get a chance to have an impact and share their wisdom and smarts and can capture all this analysis data, I would tease them and say, I hope we don't screw it up in design. But uh, so they would demand to be there and part of the design process and go th through the same thing. And that would make sure that we were focused on worthy performance. One way to do it when there's, you know, eight to 12 people, you got six different ways of doing something. They could come to consensus on here's what we train the new people. You know, this way would work. It's not the way I do it, but we can make that work. So that's, that's what you want, how, a, a good way to train people to get out worthy outputs. And so, but, and then if you're checking in with the steering team, which my model shows, I do work with mass performers that they handpicked and maybe other subject matter experts, maybe I need somebody from regulatory affairs or from HR that don't do the job for a living that we're focused on, but they have something to say, they have perspectives that need to be, their voices need to be added to the process. Um, and I check in with the client. And so I'm bringing the client along from the analysis to the design, because they might say, you know, you're, you want to have what, four practice exercises on that? I go, well, yeah, that's what the master performers said. You know, we were going to have the easy peasy exercise to get people started. And then we're going to have the difficult exercise. And then we're going to have the third exercise, which is darn difficult. And then we're going to have that fourth exercise, which is from Hades. Every last thing that could go wrong and typical in the real world here, we're going to make sure that they can do it under those conditions. What's the... Not so, what is a good number of master performers to be doing this with at the beginning? Well, I, you know, I would tell groups, uh, my clients that, you know, six would be the minimum, uh, eight to 12 is kind of the maximum, but I've done it with 20 some people in the room, oh, wow. just a nightmare, but, the, <laughs> but everybody wanted to be involved. They want to have all the right people involved and it just takes a lot longer to do that. So depending on the scope of what you're going to go after, you know, this could be a day meeting or two day, three day, four day, five day meeting to do you know, the analysis and sometimes analysis gets combined with design efforts. So you go from in and out to design, but you're not checking with the client to make sure they're okay with that. Because sometimes in my experience is that you do analysis on say a whole job or a, a major thing like territory planning. And the client might say, well, you know, some of this is really worthwhile addressing with instruction and some of it, forget it. Just because it's part of the job doesn't mean we need to develop training on it. Because there's that thing called informal learning. I used right. to unstructured OJT. And that would be a way for people to learn it. They'll figure it out on the job. You know? Okay, we have a question well, from Denise. Uh huh. Hey, guy, this has been so interesting, and I'm really enjoying it so much. And one of the things I liked is that performance model template, um, and with uh, um, and where you start with the measures. But I have noticed that frequently um, the stakeholders actually don't know the measure for that particular task. You know, like what you had in your work breakdown structure, for example, for sales, it would be they have one measure, you know, sales number, and they don't realize that there actually should be measures maybe for all those other tasks. So it seems like this could be a useful tool to help advise the client on how to define the measures or metrics for each task? Have you ever gone through that process? And if so, are they open to that? Well, clients may or may not be open to certain things. So everybody's got ways that the business measures things. It may not be granular enough to get down to one particular job and, you know, team efforts and all of that. But there's, there's uh, uh, um, KPIs, key uh, performance indicators, is one label we use for the, the clients use for the word measures um, and standards could be part of measures. So, you know, it's, it's weight is the measure. So, you know, what is the weight It's well, it's between eight and 10 ounces. It's that's the tolerance of range, but master performers, not the stakeholders and clients, they don't know this stuff. Usually they may have had the job back in the day, but they don't have the job and they're not close enough to today. And too many things have probably changed that they would, because if I can ask them the questions, the clients say, oh, we know all that stuff. And so I ask them some of these questions and they go, oh, we don't know. That's interesting though. I can see where that would be important. And I go, okay, now maybe you want to, you know, assemble a team of master performers, the people who actually know this stuff inside and out and would trust you and we'll assemble them and do this. But mas the master performers can tell you what the formal company measures are and what the informal measures are that really count and which formal company measures they totally ignore because it's worthless. And which is eye-opening to the project steering team, if you will, that they've got measures in place that the 
master performers totally ignore and actually don't care about. Um, and just like policy and procedures that they don't care about, they're going to go get the job done and they're going to go get it done right. So, but it is, can be used as a way to help an organization establish the measures for their people's performance. Um, because nobody really, you know, so uh, I'm overgeneralizing here a bit, but you know, you assemble a team of master performers, they know how they're measured formally and informally. They know how to get the job done. Now, sometimes I've helped uh, my client uncover the fact that they were breaking the law when they were doing it. And the master performers did not know that they were breaking the law, but it seemed like if I just skirt this policy procedural thing, I can get the job done quicker and faster and you know hit my sales numbers, blah, 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 or whatever the numbers are. And then they come to find out that, oh, we've done an inadequate job of informing them that this is what the law requires. These are what the regulations, codes require. Um, and so it's a chance to bring people together that have insights into the performance and what's required, what are all the stakeholder requirements. You know, nobody can represent the, the world of government and the regulatory, regulatory issues than people from regulatory affairs. The master performers, the people working on the line, the people on the front lines working in the stores, they don't know what those requirements are. And companies have put in processes and guidance and you know guardrails to keep people on the straight and narrow path and not to wander into illegal activities. But sometimes people do it because the guardrails are, are faulty or they're not always there. And so if it's high stakes, then they want to pay attention to that. Or if they've been you know hit by the regulators with fines and things, then they may want to go fix those things. But yeah, I think that so who you know not even if you can get a group of mass performers to come to consensus on something does not make them right. Good point. This, yeah. this is kind of, this is kind of tricky here. So we've got to have lots of voices beyond mass performers. And, you know, we, we've tended to call the people that we work with subject matter experts, SMEs. Um, and um, I call them other subject matter experts because they aren't necessarily experts in the performance that we're focused on. I'm not interested in the developing training on topics that have universal appeal. I need to have, I need to focus on outputs that require tasks and then maybe need topics so that you can learn, do the tasks and get to the outputs. But I'm always looking at that term. My terminal performance objective is my terminal learning objective. The ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to meet stakeholder requirements. Right. And uh, you know, you got to get the right people together and it's not, so sometimes I have novice performers involved besides master performers and other subject matter experts. I have sometimes have management and supervisors, but the other subject matter experts could be the HR folks, could be the regulatory affairs folks. Um, as, as always, it depends. And so that's part of the dialogue that you have with the client and the stakeholders because the requester, the client, may not know all of that stuff themselves. And so sometimes when they get the uh, a broader uh, command and control mechanism, I always tell the clients, hey, I'm giving you a command and control mechanism. It's also command and control and empowerment because you're making business decisions, you're empowering me to go off and do things with some confidence that I'm not wasting my time or your money doing things. But, and I'll check in with you before I go do anything with the analysis data. I'll make sure that you're okay with it. And that's quite deliberate on my part because I want them to see, here's what training won't solve, here's what training can address. Right, that makes sense. We, we have a, a very broad question that, um, from Gabe, it looks very interesting. He says, what role do you see automation and AI play in our field of performance improvement and instructional system design? Very interesting question. I just finished uh, Artificial Intelligence and Learning by Donald Clark of Donald Clark Plan B in Bristol, England, uh, just this past weekend, a very interesting book about that. So I think that um, we're, we're not quite to where everything is, but there's a lot of uh, things coming in terms of, you know, when we design uh, instructional interventions, solutions, we could be using chat bots in the future. We could be doing lots of things. Automation, artificial intelligence and automation combined will take away from some of the tasks of our target audiences because they'll be automated, um, leaving them with more, you know, critical things to do where their, you know, cognitive abilities and, and the human things uh, can attend to. 
But from our own standpoint, so uh, Dr. Richard E. Clark, uh, Dick Clark, a famous uh, researcher in our field, um, he's got he's working on a thing called cognitive task analysis. He's been doing this for decades. Um, I've got several videos where I've interviewed him about uh, this. Um, he's a, a retired a professor emeritus from uh, Southern California University, and uh, but he's working with the Zuckerberg Foundation and blah 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 and and others trying to create art, uh, use artificial intelligence to do cognitive task analysis. And the issue is is that when we do analysis, you know, we can see certain things. Our experts can talk about certain things, but what the research shows us, and this is a huge issue for us, is that experts will miss up to 70% of what a novice needs. Oh. Decision thinking processes, the over, the covert behaviors. We can see the overt physical behaviors that people do to get a job done. Sometimes the hand is quicker than the eye and that makes that tricky. But other times it's really, what are the decisions that are being made? Well, experts and really every last one of us, you, me, and everybody in this uh, Zoom meeting, uh, has automated their own thinking processes. So when we drive the car, we're not thinking about every last thing that we're doing, we're on automatic pilot, so to speak. And so he's using artificial intelligence and trying to develop his cognitive task analysis to elicit from experts one at a time and comparing their notes and going back to them and automating the process I described earlier um, to get down to what are all the details. And he says, you know, his own methodology, cognitive task analysis, CTA, We'll, we'll get to 85%, and then you have to implement it and then, then do continuous improvement to get it closer to 100%. Um, because so much of, and he's worked with surgeons at Stanford University trying to capture what are all the, the explicit and tacit knowledge that's, that surgeons use when they're doing surgery, which is you know critical high stakes performance. And, uh, and so he's been successful in doing that, but working with experts who don't, can't, they will try and tell you because their ego is demanded of them to tell you everything that they do and basically, but they'll miss 70%. Even when they know they'll miss 70%, they'll still miss about 70%. The good news is that the 30% that everybody knows is different from the next people, group of people. And so you talk to enough of them, you're going to build this, this uh, more rich, uh, uh, complete. So I think artificial intelligence has a lot of promise. I don't think it's quite there yet, but you can see a lot of things coming, but I would rec highly recommend, it, recommend artificial intelligence for learning Donald Clark. Um, I think it's a great book. Um, Interesting. It, yeah. uh, what's current and what, what's coming. I'm really glad that you pointed out that you have many of these interviews that you've conducted with, with experts in our field on your website. I've really enjoyed those. So if, if people haven't um, gone there and, and, seen them I would recommend that and Denise uh, who had to run she also wanted to um, to note that if you're not following guy on Twitter you should so uh, you want to give us your Twitter handle again I put it at the top of the chat but it's way off the screen now yeah it's at at uh, guy w Wallace one word uh, so G U I W W A L L A C E great uh, and, on my, and I do have a collection of 130 videos, a, a series that I started in 2008 on HPT practitioners. And my intent was to show the diversity of HPT practitioners and their HPT practices. Because many of us came in through the side door, we're accidental trainers, we're accidental performance improvement uh, specialists. Um, and so how did people get to where they were? So I wanted to capture their stories and what you know, some of what they do and who influenced them, what influenced them, people, articles, and books. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, I'm I, doing see, that. I see Gabe has unmuted himself. He's the one that asked the question about AI. Did you have a follow-up question, Gabe? Virginia, thank you so much for the opportunity. One uh, logistical question. I cannot see uh, access to the slides. I scroll to the top of the chat box and I don't uh -huh. see it. So uh, is there a secret I'm missing? Hmm. I maybe I could send them to you directly. Do you want to put? Yeah, if you give me your um, email in a private chat message here, I will copy and paste it and send them to you by email. I'll send my email and my bank account for everyone. To <laughs> Sounds <grow>. perfect. <laughs> send that to me. So I have a question for Guy. Certainly. 
So, Guy, I appreciate the presentation. You know what? For someone who's been in the profession for, uh, you know, more than a day, you have a lot of energy. Where is that coming from? Is it, is it something else or is it just the profession itself is <laughs> rejuvenating? Great What's question. the secret, man? It's this uh, carbonated water that I drink. Oh, my goodness. No, it's uh, um, when you love what you do. And I've been very, very lucky in my career to have a chance to work with people uh, like Gary Rumler, uh, and I, and through my association with ISPI, um, I can tell you that as a, as a consultant since 1982, I would bet that over 80% of my consulting work projects, paying projects, came from my relationships at ISPI uh, and NSPI. Um, and uh, my ability to work with people like Bob Nager, the late Bob Nager and the late Joe Harless and the late Gary Rumler, you know, came from a, a lot of my involvement with my professional home, uh, NSPI now ISPI, and uh, so I and I and I, I love the chapter experience. It's very different nowadays. Uh, we were busy back in the '80s, believe it or not, but not quite as busy as people are nowadays. Um, and so the world has changed, and so doing virtual meetings and things like that, but, you know, humans are social animals, so a chance to get together and work with people. COVID-19 is, you know, uh, put a kibosh on that right now, but that someday, hopefully, that will pass, and we can get together as groups. So, you know, you guys being involved with your local chapter one way or another and, and developing your professional networks through Twitter and LinkedIn and et cetera. ISPI uh, on their website has got their own kind of internal uh, social network, if you will. Um, you know, that's that's critical. And I and one of the things that I learned from NSPI back in the day was that everybody at NSPI, even if they were gruff, Joe Harless was gruff. You'd come up and ask him a question, you'd go, hey, I got any money? You know, and then he would say, well, what do you want? And uh, so the tradition that I grew up in is one of sharing, of being mentored freely by people. And at one time I asked Gary Rumler, how the heck was I ever going to be able to repay him for everything that he's done for me? And he was writing at a whiteboard and, he's, and he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you can't. And then he went back to writing. It was very dramatic. And, and then he stopped again and he looked at me and he said, you're going to have to do what I did. I had to do. I couldn't pay my mentors back. You have to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been on this kick to pay it forward um, since, you know, I was doing it before 99 when this incident happened in his offices in Tucson. But uh, um, so I think that, you know, having the right people in your professional network, people who understand the science of learning, the science of performance improvement, uh, what's valid, what's not, under what conditions, you know, it's a complicated thing. And we can best learn that from each other and following and, and learning from the right people. But there's a lot of snake oil out there also. And so um, I think that's having the right people in your professional network, not just a large network, but the right people is most important. One of my favorite things from conferences, uh, NSBI conferences in the, in the past were the two of Joe Harless's associates, a guy named Claude Lineberry and another guy named Bob Carlton. Uh, they used to plant themselves at opposite ends of the room in, and they would deliberately go into presentations that they intended to challenge. <laughs> the, of the speakers talking, the one would pop up and say, do you have any data to support that? And the other one would pop up and say, and data is plural. And that was my signal that, ooh, maybe what I'm listening to isn't valid. I need to ask them about that. So we all need that kind of help and guidance in, in addressing um, this and we probably can't know it all. There's no Renaissance men and women in the world anymore. There's way too much to know, even in our own little field here of performance based instruction or learning experience design. You know, it's great to hear somebody say this. Uh, to the extent that it's appropriate, could you like suggest what you think might be snake oil right now? Uh, learning styles. Uh huh, yeah. Generational differences, multitasking. Um, um, using uh, level one evaluations known as SMILES tests. Um, the late Roger Chevalier worked for Century 21 and he was brought in to be the head of their training organization. He was told that out of the 100 trainers he had, he had to fire 10 people. 
and here's the people who have the worst evaluations from their students. He investigated further and found that those 10 worst instructors as evaluated by their students had the top students out in the field performing in real estate and nobody liked those instructors because they made them work what Robert Bork would call desirable difficulties. So we can't make it fun. We've got to worry about gamification and making everything fun through gamification. If you want to simulate people's authentic performance of performing tests and put up a scoreboard, a leaderboard and all that kind of stuff, that's fine. But keep it authentic, keep it real. Enough with the fun stuff of, uh, of instruction because I think that those are, those are traps. Now clients come to us and they want to make things fun. They want to make it a game. They want to do all those kinds of things. We, if we can work with them to get it to be a performance oriented game simulation um then that's worthy but otherwise if we're having interactive kinds of stuff that have no meaning back on the job because everything needs to go back on the job we you know we need to look at what what helps or hinders transfer back to the job from the learning event whether that's a classroom or virtual event self-paced readings watching videos and things like that and we also need to quit uh addressing things that are better left to informal learning um, we need to understand the metrics of business like ROI and ROE is not return on expectations. It's been return on equity since the 1920s. So we got a lot of stuff we need to uh, watch out for in our field. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's a very beneficial uh, field because we get to help people improve their lot in life by improving their performance on the job and you know you can't control everything and they could get downsized and and put out but um if we can help them improve their knowledge and skills and, and ability in one context you know if it's close enough close transfer versus far transfer we can get them to be prepared for the next job uh, well, that's excellent i'm so glad you you mentioned the things that you did that's fantastic anybody still left on the call have a, a question or um something they'd like guy to comment on i can add one more since my mic is open is that okay is that okay sure. virginia sure shoot sure well you know i'm looking at there is uh, donna there is david there's guy of course because it's your job virginia of course it's your job but the people who are here, I'm, you know, hey, these people are motivated to learn and hear more. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> nobody has a job, but all of us are here because we want to hear from Guy. Uh, one thing I just want to add, Guy, it looks like you are a people person. You know, you get energy from people. Uh, and um, if I can just add this perspective, like, you know, if you walk into a room, you know, you, you kind of bring your energy, your positive energy, uh, if you have that positive energy, you can bring out the best in people. If you have a crummy attitude, you can, I think everyone sucks. So I, I have to say, you must have a very positive energy to be contagious and, you know, make all the people around you smell like roses. Am I, am I reading you right? So you are not only uh, a people person, but you are a positive Not too being. bad for an introvert. Huh? Not Sorry. too bad for an introvert. Are you an introvert, really? I believe that. I believe that. But you, but you do what you got to do. And if you really love what you do and you have some confidence and you have some past experience that show you that you can have the results if you don't cop an attitude that you know it all and that you are perfect and all that stuff because, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the least of the perfectionist. But, uh, but, but thank you, Gabe. Because I think it is positive. It's contagious, right? So if you've got a positive attitude and you're dealing with people who are maybe in a negative situation and they've got a negative attitude, cut them some slack. Because as Rummler said, it's not the person, it's the environment, it's the process, it's the culture, it's the consequences that they find themselves in. And we need to be accommodating of people, especially nowadays, today with COVID-19 and all the stresses with people in their work lives and their personal lives, dealing with their children and the schooling situation and the threat, you know, hey, we need to uh, show some grace. It's interesting to hear you say that you're an introvert. I would not have guessed that, although I'm an introvert myself and people tell me that all the time. I say, you're not an introvert. Oh, yes, I am very much so. So I, I think that's, that's very true because it's amazing how many people over the decades now that have said that to me that I have thought, you liar. 
well, you know, that's kind of me too when I have to stand up and do that. But, uh, you know, so, you know, there's, there, we're on a scale of, you know, introversion and extroversion. And, you know, so, you know, it's, we can slide back and forth. We shouldn't place people. Oh, another uh, falsehood is Myers-Briggs type indicator and all those kinds of things. Those are disproven. You know, the, uh, the Academy of, uh, the National Academy of Sciences disproved Myers-Briggs and, and the 16 <laughs> only introversion and extroversion on the, in that thing is valid. Oh, interesting. You know, I've I heard that one before. One. I didn't really want to believe it because I like it so much, but I have heard it numerous times and hearing you say it, I guess I'll just it's, have to accept it. Well, you, you do the research on this because yeah. it's out there, but there's, but you know, so it's not, you know, so people would say that embracing that, using that, not to, for selection purposes, because there's a thing out there called Big Five that's been approved by the American Psychological Association, the Big Five, APA. Um, which is valid to use for selecting people for one job or another. Um, but that's, so if we wanted to help people understand their differences, you know, there may be a need for all of that, but we shouldn't be uh, valid, seemingly validating things that are false, things that are unreliable, invalid and unreliable. And that's the measures you would put against something like uh, yeah. my break type indicator. And there's a lot of people that, you know, uh, neural linguistic programming, you know, that kind of thing is wrong. You know, there's a lot of issues. I've got some of those on my website. I've got a, a thing that, that uh, uh, speaks to some of the foo-foo in uh, ISD and performance improvement. <laughs> I'll have to go look for that. Uh, this has been great. Well, it's under I, the resource yeah. tab with the 4,000 other things. We've kept you even longer than than uh, than we had intended to. So I I just want to say from from the comments that I'm seeing and from the people left on here, I'm sure we we have all really enjoyed your um, presentation, and I know that a lot of people will go back and listen to the recording as well. So thank you so much, and stay safe during these crazy times. And I hope that all of our paths cross again. Thank you very Virginia, much, Virginia. Thank you so much for uh, moderating. Absolutely, you are thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, have a great rest of the week, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.